All right, well, good morning, everybody. I guess it's about time to get started if you've had your coffee. Um, my name is John. I'm here to talk about the kernel. This is the first in-person talk I've done in almost three years, which if people know what my schedule used to look like is a pretty strange thing. I can't imagine a better place to start. But it's also the first version I've given this talk in general in over a year. So a little bit has happened since I last did this. Right, the last time I did a talk like this was in August of last year. So we've merged a good 84,000 patches since then, uh, coming from nearly 5,000 developers. We've added about 3.6 million lines of code to the kernel, much of which is um, AMD graphics boilerplate, but there's other real stuff as well. Um, we put out six kernel releases with another one coming at the beginning of October. So the point that I would make here is that um, there's really no way I can cover all of that. So if you're looking for a comprehensive summary of what's going on, um, you're going to be disappointed. In fact, I haven't really tried to do that for a while. So what I intend to do is to focus on a rather smaller number of what I think of as transformational changes, things that are fundamentally changing how we will either make use of or develop the kernel in the kernel community. So um, that's, that's my theme. But let's get a few of the details over with first. This is what we've done over the last year in the kernel development community. As you can see, there have been six kernel releases coming out on the usual nine or 10 week release cadence. You can almost set your clock by the kernel release schedule these days. Each one of these is a major release, somewhere between 12 and 15,000 commits added to it. And each one involving the work of about 2,000 developers. Now, this is really pretty normal for the kernel these days. The only thing that I might point out is that the nearly 2,100 developers contributing to 5.19 were, in fact, the highest we've ever seen. So we do continue to, to grow the kernel community. We have an ability to bring people in that I think a lot of projects would really love to be able to match. Um, there's, there's a lot of people who are out there wanting to work on the kernel for one reason or another, and it helps to keep the community healthy. So this, of course, is the mainline kernel as released by Linus Torvalds. But none of us run mainline kernels these days. Very few of us do. Only the more adventurous among us do that. What we run are what are called the stable updates, or something derived from that, usually by our distributor. So this is the current status of the stable updates. There are six of them being maintained now. They're being kept around for a period of up to six years. Um, 5.19 is also being maintained, but that will last only for about another month. So the thing that I would point out here is that these kernels have seen a lot of change, a lot of stuff going into them. 4.14 has at this point, and this, by the way, is a little bit old, but almost current, has received over 24,000 changes since the allegedly stable 4.14 kernel release was made. That is over a full development cycle's worth of changes. In fact, getting closer to two development cycles full of changes. So there's clearly a lot of stuff left that we still have to fix after we put out a nominally stable kernel release. It takes a long time to really find all of the bugs and get them fixed. In fact, I was kind of curious about just how long it takes. So I wanted to do a little bit of an inquiry into where these bugs are coming from or actually something that's a little bit easier to answer, which is when are these bugs coming from? How old are they? And the nice thing is that kernel developers help me in this, in this project. This is a typical commit message. This is just a, a bug fix that I found in the 5.19 series. There's nothing particularly special about it. It's just one of many. But one of the things that developers do when they're putting in a bug fix, besides describing the bug and what's being fixed and all that, is they add this fixes line that says, that indicates which commit introduced the bug in the first place. This is useful for the stable kernel maintainers to know how far the backport it and such. It lets you know how old this bug was, how long it has been in the kernel. Now, in this particular case, the developer also helpfully put that it was introduced in 4.14, but they don't have to do that because the, the fixes line alone is sufficient to tell us how old this bug was. So I looked at 5.19 and all the things that it fixed and saw where the bugs came from and got a nice illegible plot that looks like that. Um, but if you zoom in on that, you start to see a few things up there. The top line is 5.18. So the 5.19 kernel fixed 268 bugs that were introduced in 
So there are that many that were carried over from the previous kernel release. It also, by the way, I didn't indicate it here, but fixed something like 700 bugs that were introduced in 5.19, bugs that were never actually released in, in a stable kernel. So you can see that, but remember that other bug I was looking at came from 4.14, which was there. In fact, 17 bugs from 4.14, which was released five years ago, almost exactly five years ago, were fixed in the 5.19 kernel, which was released last month. So these bugs hang around for a long time. In fact, you can see this long tail of bugs. And if you go to the other end of the plot, you see that there's in fact a quite long tail of bugs. And we are still fixing bugs that were introduced in the 2.6 kernels. In fact, if you look at the kernel release history since we went over to Git, the entire known history, there are only three releases that um, did not introduce bugs that were fixed in 5.19. So these bugs hang around for a while. There's, there's an interesting singularity there at, at 2.6.12, and one might think that 2.6.12 was a really terrible release. They had put all those bugs in. But 2.6.12, of course, is the beginning of the Git era. That's when we started using the Git source code management system. So those bugs are actually bugs that were really introduced into the kernel any time from the beginning of Linux through to 2.6.12 in 2005. So that's why there's a whole bunch of them that pile up there. But it is an indication that some of our bugs are indeed very old. So a summary of this is that we're going to be fixing bugs for an awfully long time. We are hopefully introducing them faster than, or fixing them faster than we are introducing them. I intend to do some analysis to try to figure out if that's really true. But uh, in any case, even at that rate, bugs stick around for a long time. We have a lot of bug, old bugs in our kernel. So moving on to some of the big changes that I wanted to talk about, I have a handful of them here. The one I want to start with has been certainly a big topic at the Linux Plumbers Conference and other such, which is the Rust programming language, which is, with any luck, coming to the kernel sometime soon. And people might ask, why are we going to try to introduce a new programming language for kernel development, and why Rust in particular? And the answer to that comes down to a few things. But one thing to start with is all those bugs that we were just talking about. The Rust language is designed to make it an awful lot harder to introduce many types of bugs, right? It allows you to define types that can enforce all sorts of rules, such as locking rules. In the kernel, to access a shared resource, you have to take a lock, typically. Later on, you have to release the lock. But there is really very little that can enforce that in the C programming language. So we have bugs where data structures are accessed in racy ways. We have bugs where somebody fails to drop a lock in the right place, that sort of thing. Rust can enforce most of this at compile time. So those sorts of bugs just vanish. The same is true with, for example, memory allocation, memory safety, that sort of stuff. The C language is plagued by this concept of undefined behavior. Places where the standard says, if you do this, then anything can happen, and the compiler is free to just crash your program or go off and drink all your beer or whatever, that sort of thing. The problem is that undefined behavior is almost impossible to avoid in an actual real-world C program. It happens all the time. And then strange things can happen. Rust is intended to, to eliminate that, to have behavior be defined in all situations and get rid of this whole big bear trap that lives in the C language that, that continues to bother us. The other thing is that while we have a lot of accomplished C programmers in the kernel community, a lot of the developers who are coming into the world now are less than thrilled about working in C. It's, it's not, you know, it's something that their grandparents used. And they would rather have a language that helps them get programs right from the beginning, that sort of thing. So a lot of those developers are currently perhaps deterred from getting into the kernel community for a number of reasons, C being one of them. I've already seen a fair amount of interest from people who saying, if I can work in Rust in the kernel, then I would like to do that. I think that, that bringing in a language like Rust is a key to bringing in a new generation of developers, which is a topic I'll come back to a bit later on. And I think that's, that's really important. So given all this, one might wonder, what, what's the holdup? This has been worked on for a few years. Why isn't it there already? And the answer is, comes in a few forms, one of which is that Rust is not the easiest language to learn, either if you're learning it at the beginning or if you're learning it coming from a C background. It doesn't really look much like C. 
So I just went into the kernel crate that's being proposed there and picked out a simple function. This is a function that will panic the kernel. And if you know Rust, you can read this, and you know what all of this stuff um, does. If you can't, well, I just saw a comment from a kernel developer this morning saying that Rust is programming by smiley, or um, programming by emoji. It, it really can look that way to a lot of people if you don't understand what the lifetime markers and all that stuff actually look like. So it's all stuff you can learn, but it is new, it is different. And this is a problem for the thousands of people who work in the kernel community now, who know C very well, who know the code very well, who are going to have to learn this if Rust comes in the kernel, even if they themselves do not intend to write any code in Rust, because they have to be able to maintain the code that is submitted by others. They have to be able to decide what goes in. They have to be able to fix it. So this is going to impose a huge learning burden on a large community of developers, and that naturally is going to create a certain amount of resistance. And there are people who are not uh, pleased with this, this idea at all. The, the people promoting Rust in the kernel are signing up for a a whole lot of hand-holding and developer support. And the good news is that they seem to understand this. But it's, it's going to be an interesting process to get people up to speed on this. Another problem with Rust is that the language is still evolving. C is pretty static these days. Rust is still changing from one run release to the next. There are a whole lot of features that have not been stabilized. And the kernel needs all of them. So. So we don't really have a stable version of the compiler to work with, and we're having to use features from nightly releases and all that. And that makes people nervous when you're talking about building a production kernel with, with this, this kind of thing. We've gone out of our way to ensure that the kernel can be built with a whole variety of, of C compilers of varying ages so that anybody can do it. With Rust, you're going to have to use the current development version of the compiler. And that, that makes people nervous, and again, with good reason. And finally, there are some things that are simply hard to do in the Rust language due to the way it works. A classic example is the doubly linked lists that the, the C uses heavily throughout. Due to the way Rust works, you really cannot easily make a doubly linked list because you're trying to do ownership in both directions, and Rust wants one owner of each data structure and so on. It gets very complicated very quickly. Um, there was a whole discussion at the Rust conference last week about pinning and how you simply initialize a self-referential data structure so that it doesn't get wrecked when the Rust compiler moves it around and so on. So there's some hard problems to be solved because some things that we do are just hard to do. And then I would point out that kernel developers can be fairly conservative sorts of folks at times. Um, again, with good reason. If you make a mistake in the kernel, you can create problems for incredible numbers of users, and these problems can only show up years down the line when that kernel shows up in some enterprise distribution. So kernel developers have learned to be very careful. But it, this works both ways, and it also can lead to resistance to, to the bringing in of new technologies that we really need to have. And we're certainly running into that. Uh, this is a, a quote from a kernel developer whose name I'm withholding for, for their own protection from a few months ago, this developer was simply flat out insulted by the idea that his skills were not up to the task of writing safe code in C, and that we needed to use a language that made writing safe code easier. Right? You, you run into this sort of thing in, in any community, and certainly in the kernel community, and this is going to take some work to overcome. We're doing it. I think we're going to get there. And I think that it's pretty clear that the Rust support will be merged on an experimental basis. It could happen as soon as 6.1. I think it's going to take just a little bit longer than that. Um, it will be a subject of discussion at the Maintainer Summit tomorrow, and we might have a little bit more insight then. But it's, it's coming soon. If it doesn't come in 6.1, it will probably come sometime early in 2023. And then the, the show will begin, and we will see how well it really works for development of kernel code. So next thing I want to talk about, how many of you know what IOU ring is at this point? So probably less than half of the audience. Um, IOU ring takes a little bit of, of explanation. This is a new API in the kernel. And let's start by talking about the traditional Linux or Unix system call API. If you want to read data into a buffer, you call read. 
You need to pass a, a, an open file descriptor, a buffer, and a length, and the kernel's job is to fill that buffer with that many bytes of data from that file descriptor. Pretty simple. But this, this system call has some limitations that have bugged people for many, many years. It's single-threaded and it's synchronous. You call read, nothing happens until that read has completed. Everything stops in that thread. There's, there's really nothing else that can go on, which doesn't work well in the modern world of large numbers of processors and you're trying to do a lot of things in parallel and that sort of thing. Read is also simply a system call. One thing that Unix developers have learned many years ago is that system calls will slow your program down and one of the best ways towards better performance is the avoidance of system calls. Linux system calls are faster than most others, but they, they still are impediment. You've got a context switch. There's stuff that has to happen. So you want to avoid system calls whenever you can. If you do a lot of reads, you have to do a, a lot of system calls. So what's another way that you could do this? If you use IOU ring, you end up setting up a, a shared memory area. This memory is shared between the kernel and user space. Both sides can access it directly as memory, and it's organized as a circular buffer. So you put things at one end, in at one end, pull things out the other. In this case, user space is inserting commands, where commands are something like read this many bytes from that file, and then the kernel is consuming them at the other end of the circular buffer and executing them. So these two things are happening in parallel, asynchronously from each other. User space can put a whole bunch of commands into this buffer without waiting for any of them, so you can stack up a lot of stuff to do. The results then come back in what's called the completion queue, which is another shared memory area, again, organized as a circular buffer. But this time, the kernel is the producer in that buffer, writing results into the buffer, and user space is consuming those results out to find out what happened to the request that it put into the submission queue. So the results, of course, can show up in a different order than they were put into the submission queue because it's all asynchronous. Everything is completed when it's completed. So this brings some real advantages that people have been looking for. It allows a process to do operations asynchronously. We've had some support for that since the, the 2.5 days, really, but it has never worked all that well. It's only supported certain use cases. This is general asynchronous I.O. that can work with pretty much any I.O. device out there and files and so on. So we finally have a true asynchronous interface for the kernel. But the other thing is that as long as those buffers do not empty out, User space can continue submitting operations, and the kernel can continue putting out results with no system calls happening at all. It just, each side just checks the memory buffer, deals with whatever has been put in there, and executes from there. So no system calls at all. This has resulted in some pretty amazing I.O. speed benchmarks if you're trying to do that sort of thing. Um, it has enabled a, a level of I.O. performance that, that we've never really had before. And so this has a lot of people excited. Because if you're trying to write you know, a busy network server or a whole lot of other things that do a lot of I.O., this really helps a lot. But there's actually more to it than just the asynchronous nature of it. One of the things that's worth mentioning is what's called registered files and buffers. And to explain that, we need to go back to that system call. Right? The read system call has to do the work of copying the data into the buffer. But there's actually a whole lot more that has to be done here. The kernel has to look at that file descriptor, verify that it's a valid file descriptor, that the process is able to read from it, and then it has to lock down the file descriptor so it does not get closed while the read operation is taking place. Then it has to examine the buffer and make sure that this is actually a valid buffer in that process's memory area. If that buffer is not actually resident in RAM, it has to page it all in, it has to lock it all down so that it will stay there, and then finally it can put some data into that buffer. For many operations, if, for example, the data being read is already cached in the kernel, which may well be the case for file I.O., then this setup overhead is the, the biggest cost of the whole operation by far. A registered file allows the kernel to do that setup work for the file descriptor and lock it down once, and similarly for a registered buffer. You register both with the IOU ring subsystem. It remembers them, and then you can do operations on both of those without incurring that overhead going forward. So that takes out much of the overhead of doing I.O. and again helps to increase I.O. speed significantly. There's a whole wide range of commands that you can do, not just things like read and write. You can open files and accept network connections and send messages. And there's work going on to add things like 
creating a new process and other sorts of things that are not really I.O. related at all. A whole lot of, I think in the end, we're going to end up being able to do almost anything you can do with a system call by way of IOU ring as well. So you can fill up this thing with a lot of operations. These operations can be chained. You can put them in series. So if you put in, say, and open a bunch of reads and then a bunch of writes, say, to a different file descriptor and a close, all of that stuff can be put in the buffer. It can all be chained so that each operation begins automatically when the previous one successfully completes. And the kernel handles all that. User space just has to put the whole series in and forget about it until it's done. So it allows you to do some pretty complex things by way of the ring. It is, in a sense, becoming a separate API to, to current system calls in the kernel that allows you to load some sort of simple kind of program into the kernel and execute it all asynchronously and just get the result back when it's all done. It's a, a very different approach to programming on, on Unix-type systems, and people are starting to run with it and do interesting things with it. One of those is a thing called uBlock, a user space block driver. You know, block drivers are normally, block drivers being drivers for disk drives or similar devices, are normally entirely within the kernel. This allows you to move it into user space, and the communications with the kernel happen, again, through an IOU ring buffer set. So I wrote about this. They've, they've done some things like a loopback block device and the network block device, and are reporting performance results that are actually better than you get with the in-kernel devices, uh, which is a very interesting result. So I think this is interesting for a number of reasons. Everybody has said for you, not everybody, but certainly people have said for years that microkernels are the architecture of the future. They're more robust, they're more secure, that sort of thing. There have been a lot of reasons why those have never taken off. Uh, one of which being that the communications overhead between the various components of a microkernel really kills the performance of the system. IOU ring seems to have found a way to eliminate that problem. We now have a very high bandwidth communication path that has almost no overhead at all. So we may be seeing an era where things like block drivers and other things will move out of the kernel into user space processes because they can be made more robustly, perhaps in an unprivileged mode, and without the performance costs that you used to see with that sort of thing. And this is part of a bigger trend that I've been observing for a little bit. This is a picture that I ripped off from Red Hat's website because it was easy to find, of the traditional idea of how, how Unix systems work, where you got one very well-defined box, which is user space, and has processes in it, and another well-defined box, which is the kernel space, and this very narrow little pipe that is the system call interface between them. And that's really the only way that the two communicate. I would put forth the idea that this, this model is going away that that boundary between the kernel and user space is becoming increasingly porous, and that we're seeing strange things being done on both sides. So examples would include IOU ring, which I just talked about, where you can stick programs, IO programs into the kernel and move the block drivers out of it. I haven't even talked about BPF, which is another fundamental thing, but everybody's heard all about BPF, so I left that out of this talk, except for one thing I wanted to point out, which is if you think that BPF is a cool technology, but you're not really using it, um, I thought so, and then I asked my computer how many BPF programs were actually loaded and running on it and found 17 of them, uh, mostly put there by systemd, but there are other users as well. BPF is here. It's taking over an awful lot of things and will continue to do so. And again, it's making holes in that boundary because now you're loading real programs into the kernel and running them in the kernel context in a way that is hopefully safe and uh, able to do interesting work and increase the flexibility of the system as a whole. There's a system out there called Daemon and an associated thing called Daemos. This is a mechanism that allows a lot of memory management decisions, such as which pages are you push out to, to swap, which ones you keep, to be pushed out to under user space control. There's a whole lot of mechanisms that have been added there. You can search those out if you're interested in them. User fault FD pushes that even further, of course, by allowing the, by deferring page fault handling in general to a user space process in certain cases. SecComp does a similar thing with security decisions, where you can now defer decisions on security policy to a user space process, something that was previously entirely the, the province of the kernel. 
XDP is a networking subsystem that allows the handling of a lot of network protocols and such in user space while still taking advantage of, of kernel drivers, that sort of thing. The people who are really looking for high performance with networking have gone over to using XDP. It's done again with BPF, of course, and that sort of stuff. So the thing that I would point out here is that in my mind, Linux systems are gonna look an awful lot different in the future as all of these technologies really set in and take hold and the way we program our systems changes. And the system call interface is not going away, but I think a lot of the code that we use a lot of the code that we work on is going to only use those interfaces to gain access to these other ways of working with the kernel, which offer more flexibility and better performance and um, the ways to, to make the kernel really work the way you want it to do. And that's gonna lead, I wouldn't say the fragmentation, but it is gonna lead to a world where the kernels that we are running are not all the same anymore because depending on which BPF programs you've loaded into your system, your kernel is going to behave very differently than a kernel on some other system out there. So it's a more flexible world and that's gonna have, I think, both ups and downs, but mostly ups, that's why we're pushing in that direction. So the last thing that I was going to talk about is a subject that I refer to as generational change, talking about the development community now. This is a picture that I took in 2001 at the very first Kernel Development Summit. So there are some familiar faces there. If you go out, you will find some of these people wandering the halls. If you go over to, to the Linux Plumbers Conference, you'll find an awful lot more of them. A lot of these people are still around. Um, some of them, I think, are still wearing the same clothes. Um, but a lot of these people are the people who are our top level maintainers who are in a lot of ways in charge of how our development community works and what we do. So there are some very good things about this. This development community represents a really unparalleled depth of skills and experience. We have people who have been working on the kernel for 30 years and know it from one end to the other. They know not only how the kernel works, but they know how our development process works they know how things are done and just as importantly, why they are done that way. I think there are very few software projects out there that have had this many people stick with them for this long. And if you look at in most projects within companies, people come, people go, and the people who are working on it now may have very little to do with the people who started it years ago, even if the software itself is as old as the kernel is. So this, this is a really good thing. This is not something that we want to, to lose anytime soon. But at the same time, it, it brings some, some problems with it, including a resistance to change I already alluded to when talking about bringing rust into the kernel. We have people who've been working on the kernel for 30 years in C, and don't necessarily see a reason why they should do it any other way. It has worked very well for them until now. And so they resist putting things in. Um, and you will find that in a lot of, of areas whenever somebody tries to bring new technologies into the kernel. We often run into that sort of resistance. We also run into it in the development process itself. The kernel project famously still uses email as its primary communication and um, and management mechanism. There are a lot of good reasons for it. I really still don't think that, you know, the, the modern web-based forge systems and all that will really scale very well to a project the size of the kernel, where you have thousands of developers and all this stuff going on at once. It's very hard. But to a great extent, we're not really even trying. Right? Again, email has worked very well for all of us. You know, we figured out how to configure our email system to work well for us back in the 1990s sometimes, and um, haven't really changed it much since and don't really want to change it now. And so there's, there's not a whole lot of impetus to change to a, a new way of, of development. And again, it works for the existing community. It tends to be an impediment for, for new developers who have to figure out how to set up their email to actually deal with the sort of volume, that sort of thing. 
have to figure out that they shouldn't actually subscribe to Linux kernel because they will really regret it. Um, have to figure out how to send a patch out of their corporate email system and not have it be corrupted on the way out. All this sort of thing. You see people struggling with this sort of thing. And I believe it turns away a lot of our developers, especially those who would fix one thing and then move on, which are important community to have as well. A lot of these people just don't want to deal with it. The other thing I would point out, if you look at this picture, this is not the most diverse crowd that you've ever seen. If you take a picture now, it is a little bit better, but not that much better. Really not that much better at all. It hasn't improved that much in, in 30 years. And sometimes I worry that we have kind of given up trying. The, the things that we have tried don't seem to have worked, that sort of thing. We really need to, I think, turn over some of our community because we were leaving a lot of talent on the table. We we're missing out on the contributions that an awful lot of people could be bringing by having a, a, a community that is this, this undiverse. So I would really like to see that, that fixed. I would really like to see a new generation of developers come in that can, um, can change that situation and make our development community look more like our user community and, and the world as a whole. I think we need that to be successful going forward and to last for another 30 years. And finally, the kernel maintainers are increasingly an increasingly tired and increasingly grumpy set of single points of failure. You have people who are choke points for various subsystems. Um, they didn't generally want to be that way. I mean, I am arguably one of them. There are many of them out there. But they're the only people who are maintaining a particular subsystem, so you have to go through them. They tend to be overwhelmed. Partly because while companies are happy to employ kernel developers, they tend to be a little bit less thrilled about paying for kernel maintainers. And so people are often trying to squeeze maintainership duties in to spare corners of their time or on their free time and so on. And so they get tired. Um, they, they drop out at times. It's a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a vulnerability in our development process that I would really like to see addressed somehow. So um, what can we do? How can we change? Because this is going to change, because these developers who've been working on the kernel for 30 years are eventually going to find something else to do one way or another. Right? We are going to go through a change here. It may not be this year or next year, but it's coming. So one of the key ones is, is getting away from this single maintainer model that, that we still have throughout much of the kernel. Um, a developer I know once described the kernel as being hundreds of independent little fiefdoms. And it tends to be that way. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are some subsystems that have gone to, to groups of maintainers that can all handle the maintenance duties. Those subsystems tend to be a lot happier and less grumpy in general. We're making progress there. And it really showed its value last year when one of our most senior and most important kernel maintainers had a health crisis and had to drop out for, for quite a long time. And maintenance of that subsystem, one of the busiest subsystems in the kernel, continued on to at a level that almost nobody even noticed the outage, which was really pretty amazing. A few years ago, it would not have been that way. It would have been a serious problem. We need more of that because these things will happen. Um, documentation, of course. I can't do a talk without yelling at people about documentation because it always kind of falls by the wayside. But the developers in our community contain in their heads a lot of what people are calling tribal knowledge of how things work and why they work this way and why we've done things. When they go away, that knowledge is going to go with them. We really need to set down an awful lot of more of it into our documentation so that the people who come, come in can pick it up and not have to learn these lessons the hard way, which you really see now. You see a lot of this with people who just submit patches that go against the way something is done in some subsystem and they don't understand why, and they have to be corrected. We lose a lot of energy that way now. In the future, if we lose the knowledge to review these patches and correct people, then we're going to have worse problems. So we need to increase our energy put into documentation. This is another thing that companies tend not to want to pay for. And so it doesn't happen. And it's, it's a problem throughout the, the open source ecosystem and very much a problem in the kernel. 
And finally, I believe the kernel community has long underinvested in its development tools. This is the community, after all, that did not use the source code management system for its first 10 years of operation. Um, it says something there. But it is also the community that once it did decide to use a source code management system, created one that transformed how everybody develops software. Um, the scale on which we do things tends to mean we put unique demands on tools, and if those can be solved, they solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. So the point I would make is that investment in tools has always really paid off very well for the kernel community. We don't do enough of it. We've seen some of it recently, especially coming out of the Linux Foundation in the addition of the lore archive and tools like V4, once again, I think have repaid the energy that went into them over a course of months at most. We need to do more of that. We need better tools for our whole development process so that developers coming in will have an easier time of it and can come up to speed and stay up to speed much more quickly. And then finally, just to close, we need a new generation of developers, people who can shape the kernel's next generation because things are going to change there. We do need to keep bringing people in. Maybe some of those new developers or some of you folks out there, I would encourage you to, to, to join our community and be a part of it. It is a fun and exciting and interesting place. And with that, I am done. It looks like I have a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has any. about the, you know, learning how to use the email properly in the kernel. Is there any sort of how-to on doing that, thinking of documentation? Because I don't remember seeing one. I knew it took me forever to learn how to read it. All right, um, Stephen asks, is, is there some sort of a how-to in the documentation about how to use email with the kernel community? And we do have one document called Email Clients, I believe, that is really focused on how to make your email client send patches without destroying them, which is an important thing to do. We refer people to that often because you have to do it, and some people read in there that with their particular client, it's really hopeless. You know, if you're looking at Outlook, you know, do something else, um, that sort of thing. Um, the bigger task of setting up a proper email environment so that you can get some sorts of email from the kernel community without getting the entire Linux kernel fire hose and cope with it and do that, there's, there's nothing there for that. And people just have to kind of experiment with that. Some of the tools I just mentioned include ways of setting up a more web-like interface to the to the Linux kernel archives so that you can subscribe to particular discussions and that sort of thing. Make it look a little bit more forum-like for people who want that. Um, I've written about that some on LWN. That's still in an early stage, but I think that will help some people as well. Yeah? Uh, question about the Rust infrastructure. Yes. Will we have to use a development-grade Rust compiler for the first experiments? It depends on what you mean by development-grade. The answer is yes. Um, the, the plan, as I understand, is that you'll have to use the current release of the Rust compiler, but you will have to invoke the magic macro that turns on the nightly features that are not actually stabilized and are not normally available in the current Rust compiler. So you will have to do that for a while because I mean, the number of unstable features that the kernel requires is fairly large, and it's going to be a while before they are all actually made into official Rust stable features. Okay, way in the back, you're going to have to ask loud. I'm having a hard time hearing you, sorry. Um, if you could come up here, if we have a mic somewhere, I don't know. Do we have a mic somewhere? Oh, it looks like there's a mic there, all right. Testing one, two, three. Ah. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. So the MBD user space block driver is not just slightly faster, probably about the same speed or slightly faster than the kernel device, 
but it also has many more features now, and it, it only took about a week to write. So it's actually a, uBlock is actually a lot more amazing than I think you even said in your slides. It's, a, it's a, quite a game changer. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uBlock and other interfaces like uBlock for other sorts of subsystems are in, indeed fundamental changes. And as you say, once you've moved it out of the kernel, you can write it quickly, you can add features to it, you can do things like that. It's, it's going to speed things up development-wise as well as perhaps performance-wise. And I think the development-wise part is the more important part. All right, so we have a couple of online questions. I, I can't see them. Um, yeah, I can, I can okay, talk about it. Okay, let's hear them. When do you expect us to see drivers written in Rust in a kernel release? When will we expect to see drivers written in Rust in a kernel release? I don't know. The, when Rust itself is merged, it comes with a couple of drivers. There's an NVMe driver that was written that is part of the, the Rust for Linux patch set. Uh, it, re, it supplements the existing NVMe driver. But in fact, as the developer was just saying a couple of days ago and at the Rust conference, performs just about as well as a very highly in tuned in-kernel driver. So we'll have those. Um, when we will have drivers for devices that are not currently supported by an existing C driver, that I don't know. I think it may be a while before people are willing to trust that Rust is going to stay around and commit to having a driver in that mode. But I could be wrong on that. We'll see. One more. Any view on when, we, when the next LTS kernel comes out? When will the next LTS kernel come out? That is, by convention at this point, the final stable kernel release of the year. So that will almost certainly be 6.1. That's an easy one. All right, well, I'm out of time. I think I'm done. I should get out of the way and let Torsten set up for his talk. And I thank you all very much for your attention.